All right, this is the last of our units. How sad. Or happy, I guess, depending on how you feel about the course. To start this unit, syntax, let's set the stage by getting on the same page about parts of speech and syntactic roles. Starting with parts of speech, let's define the term. A part of speech is the word class that a word occupies. For example, in English, the word cat is a noun and running is a verb. Word classes are language specific. Not all languages have the same word classes. And just because a word is in one word class in one language does not mean that it is in that word class in all languages. For example, Plains Cree just doesn't have adjectives. Instead, we use verbs. So a word like Mikoso means she or he is red, rather than just having red as an adjective. For this course, we are going to focus only on English parts of speech. English has nine broadly recognized parts of speech. Nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, determiners, degree words, auxiliaries, and conjunctions. Let's start with the more commonly known word classes. A noun is something that describes a person, place, or thing. It can be concrete and refer to a easily recognizable, physically touchable, physically imaginable thing like dog, or it can be abstract like something like idea. Verbs describe actions or states of being. Words like run, jump, but also words like is or smell. Adjectives are words that modify nouns. These are words like big, small, ugly, etc. Adverbs are words that modify verbs or adjectives or other adverbs. They can describe how an action is done, so something like quickly, or they can describe when something is done, like then or after. Prepositions are words that describe locations or spatial relations, like around, on, in, up, or down. Or they can describe relationships between other nouns, like of or by. What about the remaining classes? Well, let's start with determiners. Determiners are words that modify nouns and specify that noun. Often in English, they'll be called articles, but these can include other words like demonstratives, this or that, or possessives like his, hers, mine, yours, etc. We also have degree words, which express the degree to which something exists or has happened, like to, so, very, more, many, or quite. Auxiliaries are another class that allow us to build helping verbs and add meaning about attitude or how something is done. In English, we have a number of modal auxiliaries, which tell us about how something is done or whether or not it is completed or whether or not it is necessary. So we have will and would, can and could, shall and should, as well as may, might, and must. The most popular auxiliary verbs though are to be, or its various forms like is and was, which describes something existing. Have, which is used as in I have run, or you had been to my house. And do, which can be used in something like I do want to marry you. Note that these all can be used on their own 
when there are no other verbs in a clause. You can say, he is. You can say, I have something. And you can say, they do something. But when these are used in conjunction with another verb, we call them auxiliaries, as they help give us more information about the action. But they are not the main focus of the phrase. In the sentence, I had run over, the main verb that's describing the action happening is not have, it is run. Next, we have conjunctions. Conjunctions are words that put together phrases and clauses. They're joining words. These are words like and, nor, but, and yet. You may have noticed that the first set of word classes, nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, and prepositions, all describe actual meaningful units. These are things that have actual meaning relevant and instantiated in a sentence. On the other hand, determiners, degree words, auxiliaries, and conjunctions provide a different type of meaning that is more about bringing together the sentence in a grammatical way. This is why we say the first class of parts of speech are considered lexical, while the second class is called functional or grammatical. Now that we have a common framework of parts of speech, why don't we take a look at a sentence and parse it to determine each word's word class. The sentence that we'll look at is, the second impact led to the destruction of Antarctica. This is actually a pretty complex sentence, so why don't we start with something easy, the first word. The word the is a determiner. The is actually always a determiner. It's never a noun by itself, it's never an adverb, so that's a pretty good bet. The word second impact is a compound noun, which we can tell because it's hyphenated and it's capitalized and I'm telling you it's a compound noun. Um, if there's something that's a compound noun, I will tell you. The word lead could be an adjective, like lead ball, or it could be a verb, like the dog was led to the barn. Here the word is saying that the second impact caused or did an action that happened to create the following situation, which is the destruction of Antarctica. Because the word led is essentially synonymous with caused here, we would say that it is a verb because it's an action. Next, we have the word to. To is almost always a preposition, unless there is a verb following it, in which case it's something called an affinitive, which we won't get into here. So let's just mark it down as a preposition for now. We know from earlier that the is always a determiner, but what about the term destruction? Well, you might say it's describing something being destroyed, and that being destroyed is an action. But destruction here is actually referring to the situation of destruction. It's describing a thing. It's describing probably an abstract thing, but it's describing a thing. So we would call it a noun. Another way that we can know that it's a noun is that determiners always modify nouns. Since destruction is being modified by the, which we know because they're beside each other and the thing that's being specified is destruction, we can call destruction a noun. Of is describing a relationship between Antarctica and the situation of destruction. And because it's describing something that is essentially belonging to Antarctica, the destruction, we will call it a preposition because prepositions describe relationships. Of is always a preposition in English. Finally, Antarctica is a noun, as it's a place. 
So we have our parse sentence here. What about a slightly easier example? I was running. Well, we know that I is a noun because I is the thing that is doing the action and I is always a noun. It's actually a pronoun, but let's just settle with noun. What about the term was? Was is the past tense form of to be. But be can be either a verb or an auxiliary. Auxiliaries can be verbs on their own, like we mentioned before, but that requires they be on their own with no other verb in the phrase. So let's see if we can find another verb in the phrase. Well, what is the only other word? In this case, it's running. Running sure seems like a verb. It describes an action, and I can certainly do running. So let's ask what the word was is doing. The word was is telling us that the action happened in the past, that it is not in and of itself giving any information about what sort of action was happening. Was is simply telling us something about the temporal situation of the action. We could say it's a helping verb here. So let's call it an auxiliary. How about another example here? The dog bit him. Here, the is specifying the noun dog. So it's a determiner like always. Dog is a pretty stereotypical noun. Bit is the past tense form of bite and is an action word describing a situation of biting. So let's call it a verb. And him is a pronoun, but like before, we'll just call it a noun. Now, if we stick with this example for a few seconds, we can talk about something called syntactic roles. Syntactic roles refer to how different words behave in a sentence in a structural sense. The two most common syntactic roles are subject and object. A subject is the entity that the sentence is focused on. In English, subjects are usually the noun that is to the left of a verb in the sentence. An object, on the other hand, is a noun that is subordinate to a verb, which is to say that it exists because the verb is affecting something. In English, it usually comes to the right after the verb. In our example, the dog is the subject and him is an object. English pronouns are actually pretty good about this. They have different forms for subject and object positions. If, for example, we wanted to make him the subject and dog the object, we could say he pet the dog. Here, the pronoun changes from him to he when it is a subject. In English, only pronouns do this. There's I versus me, he versus him, she versus her, we versus us, and they versus them. Because this really only happens in a few words, English relies on word order to inform us what the subject or object is in a sentence. Other languages allow their nouns to do changing in all sorts of ways, though. The canonical example of this is Latin. Both of the following are fine sentences that mean the same thing. In English, they translate to Julius loves Atticus. So I can say Julius Atticum Amat, or I can say Atticum Julius Amat. Latin has relatively free word order, and this is because instead of saying subjects always come before verbs and objects always come after, Latin uses endings attached to nouns to indicate what the syntactic role of the noun is. Even proper nouns like names are marked in this way. The root of Julius is Juli, and it receives an us ending when it is the subject. Similarly, the root of Atticus is Attic, and it receives an um ending when it is the object. 
If we were to reverse this and say that Atticus loves Julius, we would say Atticus Julium amat. Here we put the am onto Juli and we put the us ending onto Attic. Using affixes to denote syntactic roles like this is referred to as case marking and is very popular amongst the world's languages. Now let's talk about objects. An object is anything that is affected by a verb. Things that directly receive the action of the verb are known as direct objects, or DO. In the sentence, I hit the ball, the ball is the direct object of hit as it takes the action of hitting. Similarly, in the sentence, I passed John the ball, the ball is the direct object of pass. But in this sentence, we have another object, John. John is an object because it is in some way subordinate to the verb. Without the verb, there would be no mention of John, for example. But he isn't the main thing directed by the verb. Instead, he is the recipient of something that is directly affected by the verb. Words that describe to or for whom a verb is done are called indirect objects, or IOs. In the sentence, Susan gave Mary flowers, Susan is the subject because she's left of the verb. Flowers are the thing that are being changed or manipulated by the verb, so we will say that they are the direct object, and Mary is who is receiving the flowers that are being given. So we will say that she is an indirect object. In English, we also have something that we call an oblique object. An oblique object is one that is introduced by a preposition, like to, for, by, etc. If we take the previous sentence and just adjust it slightly to become Susan gave flowers to Mary, we see here that Mary is not an indirect object, but an oblique object, which we mark with an X. The ways in which verbs pattern with regards to objects in a sentence is what we call transitivity. Transitivity simply means whether or not a verb takes one, two, more, or even zero objects. For the purposes of this class, we will say that oblique objects do not count towards transitivity. So in English, we have three levels of transitivity. We have intransitive verbs, which have a subject but no object. For example, I run. We have monotransitive verbs, sometimes just called transitive verbs, which have a subject and a direct object, but no indirect object. Something like, I love him. And we have ditransitive verbs, which have a subject and a direct object, but also have an indirect object, like, I gave him flowers. Note that I gave flowers to him would be considered monotransitive, as it has no I-O because it has an oblique object. English mainly uses word order to indicate syntactic relations, but not all languages do this. English is what is considered an isolating language. This means that English doesn't have a lot of morphological inflection. Isolating languages usually have one word for each concept and relatively defined word order. In English, we say that our language is SVO in addition to being isolating. This is to say that verbs have subjects before and objects after. Despite being unrelated to English, Mandarin is also an isolating SVO language. The most common word order cross-linguistically is SOV, subject, object, verb, which is seen in examples like Urdu, Ancient Greek, and Japanese. 
Latin, even with its freeish word order, usually defaults to SOV, with the verb at the end of a clause. Latin is not considered an isolating language, though. For example, if we have the sentence Atticus Julium Amabat, we here see that every word in the sentence has at least one affix. So instead of isolating, we would say that Latin is synthetic, meaning that words have multiple pieces of meaning attached to them, rather than each meaning having a separate word, as in English or Mandarin. Note that compared to many other languages in the world, such as Cree or Nuktitut, Latin is actually not all that synthetic. In the examples we see above, I've marked NOM as a short for nominative, which just tells us that something is a subject, and that we have something that marks the object, which is this dash ACC, meaning accusative case. FUT means future. 3SG dot subj just means that the verb is marked for agreement with the third person subject. When we talk about subject agreement like this, we are simply saying that a verb is marked for a particular person. In English, we see third singular subject agreement on our verbs. We can't say he run. We have to add an S to it, as in he runs, so that it agrees or matches with the subject. Latin's SVO word order is cross-linguistically the most common, with 45% of all languages using it. The next most common is English and Chinese SVO word order at around 42%. VSO is much less common at 9% and can be found in Irish, Arabic, Biblical Hebrew, and other languages. VOS makes up only about 3% of the world's languages and is in languages like Malagasy of Madagascar or Kar in India. Still more rare is OVS, where we have the object first, then the verb, then the subject, which is found in about 1% of the world's languages, mostly in the Caribbean languages of Brazil. And then finally, the rarest of all word orders is object, subject, verb, with less than 1% of the world's languages. And most of these are found in the Amazon. Note that these classifications are speaking to a language's most common or default word order. It's not speaking to the possibility of other forms. So all languages are somewhat flexible with their word order. Even English, for example, can use OSV word ordering in phrases like, this I will not accept. I'm not expecting for the test that you'll memorize the percentages of the different word orders, but you may be asked to look at an unknown language, one that I've made up, and determine whether or not it is OSV, VSO, etc. Finally, let's talk a little bit more about agreement. In many of the world's languages, we see subject agreement as mentioned before. In some languages though, like Plains Cree, where words have tons of morphemes and are considered what we call polysynthetic, words also mark for object agreement. This is also known as polypersonal agreement. For example, in Plains Cree, we can say Mao, meaning I see him or her. If we analyze the morphology of this, what we see is that the ne means first person singular subject, the stem wapam means see an animate thing, and the au means third person singular object. Because a verb must agree or mark for subject and object in Plains Cree, often what the language uses as a single word, English must translate in an entire sentence, as we see here. Furthermore, in roughly 50% of cases that we've seen, clauses don't have separate nouns at all. They simply have the verb with the subject and object marking. The actual subject or object may have been mentioned in a separate noun in a couple sentences or a paragraph previously, but after its initial appearance, 
it seems like speakers are happy to just have the agreement on the verb and leave the noun out entirely. Despite this, there are rarely issues where native speakers have troubles understanding what someone means, as they can use these agreement markers to determine who is doing what. Okay, so I'm going to end the video here. In the next video, we'll focus on semantic roles and how they differ from syntactic roles. See you all then.